All right, here it goes. So the overall charge on the formula unit for a compound is never zero. Actually, when you when you make the uh, when you figure out what the formula is, like when you're figuring out the uh, formula for an ionic compound, what you're trying to do is make the overall charge equal to zero. So that's false, and it's always zero. In a crystal lattice, each positive ion is surrounded by negative ions. We haven't talked about that necessarily, but it's true. Delocalized valence electrons are typical of metals and alloys. Um, we haven't talked about metallic bonding yet, but that's also true. When you name compounds, the cation is named first is true. Cation is the name that we use for an ion that is positive. So in this case, the metal is always the first thing, and it's always, it is positive. In naming a monatomic ion, the suffix, the suffix IDE is used. So a monatomic anion. Um, that's just saying the negative ion. So like in sodium chloride, sodium is plus one, chlorine is minus one. The anion that's monatomic, meaning just not polyatomic, we use the suffix IDE, which is true. That's part of the naming rules. Prefix per is used in naming the anion with the most oxygen atoms. Also true. For example, ClO4 is per chlorate, and it's the one with the most oxygen atoms. The prefix hydro is used in naming all acids. That is not true. That's false. I'm not sure how to change it. Um, instead of the prefix hydro is used not for naming all acids, but it's used for naming we cross out all and put down binary acids or acids that only contain hydrogen and one other element. In Lewis structures, hydrogen is always a terminal atom. This is true. In carbon dioxide molecule, the central atom is a carbon atom. Yep, it is. And the Vesper model is based on the idea that in a molecule, valence electrons repel each other as much as possible. Also true. So then it goes into reviewing some stuff that we've already kind of tested on a little bit. The electron configuration for the alkaline earth metals. So if you've got your periodic table, you should know by now, hopefully, that group two is the alkaline earth metals. Group one is the alkali earth metals, or the alkali metals. So this one, group one, is alkali. And this one, group two, is alkaline. Right, so very subtle difference, but big difference as far as um, compounds go. And so if you're looking at the electron configuration for the alkaline metals, they all are going to end in what? So for example, beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. And then it's going to be, well, 1s2 is helium, but then 2s2 for beryllium. Magnesium is going to end in 3s2, right? Then calcium is going to end in 4s2. Strontium is going to be 5s2, then 6s2, then 7s2. And so for this, something s2 is what the electron configuration is for all everything in that group. So answer there is B as in boy. ClO4 minus is the perchlorate ion. So that's D. The formula for calcium phosphate. And they were nice with this. They tell you right here what the ion is, what the charges are. And so the 3 is going to go with the calcium. The 2 is going to go with the phosphate. And because the phosphate is polyatomic, you need to put it in parentheses and put the two with it. So the one that is in parentheses and has a two with the phosphate and a three with the calcium is C. Which of the following is not a substitutional alloy? We only briefly talked about um, substitutional and interstitial alloys, um, but the one that's not substitutional is carbon steel. Carbon steel is an interstitial alloy. With substitutional alloys, the metal ions are about the same size. Yeah? Are you going to a question like that on No. No. Your quiz tomorrow 
will just be on naming inorganic compounds and periodic trends. That's it. Nothing else. No electron configuration, nothing that's on here. But it is good to go back and review the stuff that you're supposed to already know. Yeah, very similar to the practice one that we've done. Um, in the formation of an ionic bond, electrons are what? Transfer. And which of the following elements normally exists in the form of diatomic molecules? So helium, no. Argon, no. Iron, no. Nitrogen. Nitrogen exists as N2, which is a diatomic molecule, so that's D. You can remember, never fear ice cold beer, and that will get you most of the diatomic um, molecules. So N2, F2, never fear ice, right? So that's I2, Cl2 for cold, um, well, O2, and then Br2. So never fear ice cold beer will get you to most of the diatomic uh, molecules that you need to know. So now like Bob Seeger, turn the page uh, and <clears throat> number 17. Electrons are shared in two electrons are shared in a single covalent bond. And you can see how in a future quiz I could say um, four electrons are shared in a double covalent bond, six electrons are shared in a triple covalent bond. Which of the following molecules contains only sigma bonds? Sigma bonds, the other way to think of sigma is single bonds. So the molecule that only contains sigma bonds is methane because oxygen has a double bond, which would be a sigma bond and a pi bond. Carbon dioxide has two double bonds, and nitrogen has a triple bond, which is not a sigma bond. So the only one with single bonds only is methane. Which of the following molecules contain two double bonds? So two double bonds, that's going to be carbon dioxide, and we've drawn the Lewis structure for that several times. CO2 is like this, two double bonds, unshared pairs, unshared electrons on the ends, how many pi bonds are there in a triple bond? So a triple bond is one sigma bond and two pi bonds, so there would be two. Which of the following molecules would be expected to have the greatest bond dissociation energy? So bond dissociation energy has to do with the length of the bond, and single bonds are longer than double bonds, which are longer than triple bonds. So the one with the greatest bond dissociation energy is going to be the one with a triple bond which in this case is nitrogen. So it takes more to dissociate. It takes more energy, basically, to break this bond than it does to, t to break this bond, than it does to break this bond or this bond. Next on the terms, hopefully you can see this. <clears throat> The tendency of an atom or in a compound to attract electrons, that would be its electronegativity or electron affinity, so that's G. The kind of bond in which there is an unequal sharing of electrons. With an unequal sharing, it would be polar, and since it's sharing, it's covalent, so polar covalent. Any bond in which there is electron sharing is covalent, which is K. Reactions that occur when more energy is released, forming new bonds, and is required to break the bonds in the initial reaction. Um, very briefly, I think we've talked about exothermic reactions, maybe. We may not have quite covered that yet. The kind of bond in which electrons are shared in an area centered between the two atoms. So that's going to be a sigma bond, H. A model that shows how the atoms are arranged in a molecule is a Lewis structure, or... Um, structural formula, if Lewis structure isn't a choice, which it isn't. A condition that occurs when more than one valid Lewis structure can be drawn, so like for the nitrate ion, for example, those are called resonance structures, so that's L. The kind of bond in which one of the atoms provides both electrons for sharing, you made it, yeah. it's called a coordinate covalent bond, so that's D. 
An example of that is when something like boron trihydride bonds with um, like NH3 and both of the electrons in that bond come from the NH3 and not from the boron and that's what makes it a coordinate covalent bond. And the combining of orbitals in an atom to form new identical orbitals um, that's the idea of hybridization but um, you don't need to know that. I should probably just take that one off of there. And the truth about that is um, some forms of hybridization um, there's evidence for, but some of the other hybridization things that we used to teach actually um, with new technology for looking at where electrons are and what orbitals they're in. Um, turns out that orbital hybridization is kind of not a thing. So which one of these has an odd number of valence electrons? If you look at this one, nitrogen has five electrons available for bonding. Oxygen has six. That's 11, which is an odd number. So that would be C. The one that has less than eight electrons around its central atom is B, BF3. More than eight electrons around it would be D. And then more than one valid Lewis structure, that's ozone, or A, and we'll get to, to that a little bit later. Next. <clears throat> All right. Is this the next page? Yeah. So, um, notice that the person that wrote this was nice to you and said that they're all ionic. So, you don't have to worry about naming for covalent compounds. And what that means is if they're not molecular or covalent, with ionic compounds, it means there's going to be no none of the prefixes like the the monos or di or tri or tetra we only do that with molecular compounds we don't do that with ionic compounds so realize that we don't use the prefixes when there are ionic compounds we only use those for covalently bonded or molecular compounds so, do not make the mistake when it's ionic of doing something like calling this magnesium dichloride. We don't use those um, prefixes when they are ionically bonded. We only, when they're, sorry, yeah, when they're ionically bonded, we only use those prefixes when they are covalent. So, if it's binary, all you do is write the name of the metal, which in this case is lithium, and then the name of the nonmetal with the suffix IDE. So instead of lithium iodine, it's lithium iodide. So this one would be Mg is magnesium. And then instead of chlorine, chloride. This one, K is potassium. And then S would be sulfide. This one we made in lab when you burned the magnesium. So that's magnesium oxide. Then with this one we get to the first one that has a polyatomic ion. SO4 is what? Sulfate. So this is lithium. Still just write the name of the metal. And then instead of sulfide, this is sul fate because it contains more than two elements. When it's got more than two elements you know you've got a polyatomic ion involved. The exception to um, the always being a metal with a non-metal for ionic bonds or ionic compounds is when you have a positive ion like ammonium so NH4 is ammonium. It's pretty much the only exception to, one of the only exceptions to the rules as far as naming. So that, the name of this, it's not a metal. So this is NH4 plus is the ammonium ion. And then we treat it as if it was 
um, binary, but it isn't. And so the correct name here is ammonium bromide. This one, calcium and phosphorus, just two elements, so it's calcium. And P is phosphorus, so that's phosphide. This one, cesium, also phosphorus, so phosphide. Here, potassium. And then the bromide ion. Here we have magnesium, chlorine, and oxygen, so we have a polyatomic ion. You still just write the name of the metal, which is magnesium. And then you've got to have your some of your polyatomic ions memorized. So you should be working on the flashcards. ClO3 is chlorate. So this is magnesium chlorate. This one is a tricky one because the charge, if lith lithium is plus one, that means this single oxygen has to be, um, this one actually isn't tricky. This oxygen is just oxide. This oxygen is minus two. So this one is lithium oxide. We have the sulfate ion again. So the metal is beryllium. And then not sulfide, but sulfate, because of the SO4. Here, one of the most important compounds for modern agriculture and keeping our 8 billion people fed. This is fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, without which uh, we might have a hard time growing enough food since our agricultural practices rely on fertilizer for a lot of things. This one is sodium bromide. I got 20 pounds of tomatoes out of my garden last night. Yeah. Most of them little cherry tomatoes, but a bunch of other big heirlooms and other things. So I got to figure out what to do with them. I've already made salsa and ketchup and soup. I don't know. Any ideas? BLTs, spaghetti. Yeah. So here, when you've got a metal that is not a representative metal, but this is a transition metal, so it's in the D block, this is where you've got to use Roman numerals. And you've got to be able to figure out what the charge on iron is. But it's relatively easy because it's with oxygen, and oxygen's charge is minus two. And if there's one oxygen and one iron, that means iron's charge has to be plus two. So you write iron, and then to, so that you know the difference between the plus two and the plus three, you put in parentheses two Roman numerals to, so that you can know that the charge on the iron is plus two. So this is iron two oxide. And then IO3, and it's also minus one, but if you're either in your chart of polyatomic ions, which you can't actually use on a test, so you have to get these things memorized, IO3 is iodate, and it's minus one, so the iron has to be plus two. So again, you've got iron two and then the name of that ion, that polyatomic ion, is iodate. What would it be called if it was FeIO33? Right, it wouldn't be iron 2 iodate, it would be iron 3 iodate. I'll just write that down. So that's iron 3 iodate. Next, <clears throat> going for some people, and I think it might be most of the class, going from the name to the formula is more difficult than going from the formula to the name. Yeah. But the process, like the video we watched um, yesterday, is to figure out, it ends in IDE, so you know it's binary. The metal then is beryllium. 
you look on your periodic table and you find out that beryllium's in group two, so its charge is plus two. Phosphide means phosphorus, so you look on your periodic table and you see that phosphorus is in the minus three column. Also though, was this one of the ones up here? No. So then to write the formula, the quick and easy shortcut, make the three the subscript for the beryllium, make the two the subscript for the phosphorus, and you've got it. So PE3, P2. That way, two times negative three is negative six, and three times positive two is positive six, positive six and negative six equals zero, so you know you've got the right formula. Nickel two bromide, this tells you what the charge on nickel is. So nickel is, in this case, plus two. Bromine is a halogen, they are all minus one. So nickel two bromide is going to be in I. The one would go with the nickel, but you don't write a subscript of one, you just write nickel. And then the two goes with the bromide, so PR2. Potassium chlorate, here's the first one that doesn't end in IDE. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, could you put it like nickel and then in parentheses, bromide, and then two? Like I had it, like where's my You mean like this? No, we don't. By convention, if it's binary, we don't. It's just bromine, so you don't need the parentheses. Oh, oh, okay. Right? Yeah, so, but if instead, let's say it was nickel 2 brom 8, right? Then brom 8 is BRO3, right? And then because it's bromine and oxygen, and there are three oxygen, then you'd need to group it with parentheses and put a 2. It's a good question. Copper 2 oxide. Oh, wait, we didn't do potassium chlorate yet. Chlorate is ClO3, and it's minus one. Potassium is plus one, so you just need one of each. They balance each other out already. So potassium chlorate is KClO3. Copper two oxide, here you know that the copper is plus two because of the Roman numeral two. And then oxide is oxygen, two minus. So it's just CuO. Magnesium sulfate, magnesium is plus two. The sulfate ion is SO4, two minus. If you haven't committed yourself to making some flashcards or, or getting on, is it Quizlet where you can do your own flashcards or whatever? Something to practice knowing these polyatomic ions, you need to get on that. Plus two and minus two, so you only need one of each for them to cancel each other out. Then manganese 4 sulfide. It's easy to get confused between manganese and magnesium, right? Be sure you read it carefully. Manganese is Mn, whereas magnesium is Mg. And then this 4 means that the manganese is plus 4. And then sulfide is minus 2. So then it gets a little tricky because you need to write this. Um, you can put the two with the manganese, right? Mn2 and put the four with the S, S4. But what is wrong with that? It's not written in lowest terms, right? If we, so it would be better to write it as MnS2 because two divided by two is one, and four divided by two is two. So you, it's kind of like reducing a fraction, putting things in common terms. Calcium iodide, iodide is just I, it's minus one. Calcium is plus two, so it would be CaI2. And then iron three perchlorate, what you know from it being iron three is that this, these three, the Roman numeral three, just means iron is plus three. Perchlorate is ClO4, 
and it's minus one so you're going to need three chlorates and one iron so you would write that Fe and then in parentheses CLO four three yeah for the most part if you can't remember the charges is there another way to like look on the periodic table to figure out the charges sure um, the biggest way with the elements is grab your periodic table and when you first get it or whatever for your quiz these are plus everything in group one is plus one everything in group two is plus two skip the transition metals everything in group three is plus three um, everything in the carbon group is going to be plus or minus four generally the nitrogen group is going to be minus three the oxygen group minus two the halogens this group 7a minus one for their charge and the noble gases don't have a charge. And so then like uh, if you're trying to find out the charge of perchlorate, is there a way to mm, that for per table? for perchlorate? Um, there kind of is, but it's a little more complex than what you probably want to um, figure out. But I can show you if you want. You know that chlorine has seven valence electrons. <coughs> and you know that each oxygen has two and so when they bond when this bonds basically what's going to happen is you've got oxygen you've got eight electrons there and so what you end up with is they as they bond they sort of cancel each other out sorta of. that's a weird way to think about it and so these seven from chlorine will match up with seven from the oxygen and that's going to leave one electron left over so All right. Uh, I don't want to get too into that. It's probably better at this point just to to memorize the charges on the polyatomic ions. So, the final page. Oh, there's one left. Sodium nitride. So sodium is in A plus one. Nitrogen is in the uh, group five A, so it's minus three. So sodium nitride would be Na3N. So then this stuff is what we're working on now. Um, it's not going to be on your quiz tomorrow, so I wouldn't worry about it. Because we're, we're working on building these Lewis structures and figuring out um, what their shape is going to be. That's the handout that I gave you yesterday where you're filling it out. Then you'll be using the model building kits, which are down here on the floor to actually build these. So for now, I'm not going to go over this part of it. You're not going to be tested on it yet. But, I mean, we could do it if you want. I don't know. Do you want? Not, not really. Not at this point. But you might need to be able to um, name some acids tomorrow. You might need to be able to um, write the formula for some um, covalent or molecular compounds. So HI, if it's just hydrogen and one other element, then we do use the prefix hydro. So that's hydroiodic acid. N2O5, you have a nonmetal and a nonmetal. So that is where you do use the prefixes. So there's two nitrogen, so that would be dinitrogen. And then the prefix for five is penta or pent. So pent oxide. Sulfuric acid. When an acid's name, when the name ends in ic, then it's from the eight ion. So that means you need to figure out what the sulfate ion is. It's one of the more common polyatomic ions.